Hello, everybody, and welcome back to a brand new episode of the All About the Metaverse podcast. I am joined by Alexis, of course, my co-host. Hello, everybody. Nice to be here. Uh, I don't know which episode are we now. Are we already like a 25th or something? Number seven. Feels like it. On seven. Okay. Well, We're still great. early. Okay. We're still early. Nice. Good stuff. Well, back to nice to be back. Well, nice today we're joined by Jeremiah, and I'm really excited about this conversation because Jeremiah is actually doing something in a virtual world, and I think that's what this podcast is all about. So, Jeremiah, hi. Thank you so much for coming to join us. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. It's great to meet both of you as well. Well, maybe, maybe I just, I just wanted, I just wanted to, to, to find out because uh, we didn't have much chance to speak, Jeremiah, but maybe as well for our listeners, you want to tell us a little bit uh, about you? And, and what is that relation between, you know, yourself, the metaverse and, and all the art that you guys are that, that doing? Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I, I'm an artist. I have a background in performance and I love emerging tech. So uh, I have an interesting background in terms of bringing those together. So I originally trained in theater. I spent about 20 years performing in children's television. So I've done, you know, things like the Teletubbies and the Doctor Who shows like that. And, and the reason I ended up there, and it, this is relevant, is that when I was studying theater, I really did not want to do straight drama. I didn't want to recreate real life on stage. I figured, why, what's the point? When we have this amazing opportunity to create completely new worlds, outrageous, bigger, larger than life characters, non-human characters, why not do that? And that's what I wanted to do as a performer. So I developed this niche as a creature performer. So I, that means I'm in full body costumes, I'm playing in unrealistic worlds, and I'm playing unrealistic characters. And from there, I, I began to discover a real interest in and, and a capacity for creating art. And but still holding on to this larger idea of like, what it is, what are we trying to do with art? What's the point of this? Why I didn't want to recreate reality. I wanted to explore possible realities, possible futures in the same way that I was doing as a performer. I wanted to do that as an artist. And that led me to exploring these emerging technologies. Once I realized that there was this emerging space, this metaverse, this, these, the, but not just there was another space, but there were also tools that were making it easier for people like me who don't have a technical background to interact with them and actually create in these environments, I got incredibly excited. So uh, w what I've just recently done is put together my very first exhibition that's taking real world artwork, that it's, you know, physical paintings like this behind me, sculptures that I've created with my hands and translated them into a virtual space. And and I have to underscore, I don't have a technical background. I, I right, so why studied... don't you tell us how you do it then? How do you do it? Yeah, because exactly. The, the, the way you say it, the way and you I think say that's... it was like, okay, everybody can do it without the technical background. So yep. what are the tools that are at your disposition, you know, to, to do exactly that? Or right. are you just, you know, like uh, copy pasting some stuff that's there and there's like put a bookmark and yeah, that was me doing yeah. that. No, that's the thing, because I've been in Web3 for, for over two years now, and I've been looking at what it, I was like, oh, my goodness, great. I've, you know, NFTs, fantastic. I want to make NFTs, but I, okay. I didn't have the skills for, to do it. Well, I had some of the skills. I, had, I, I can do some Photoshop work and such like, but I, I also think, what's the point of uh, not leveraging the medium? I feel like the work has to be able to use the medium to its advantage. Like, mm. why are we putting it? Because I wasn't, um, I, I was, there's no point to just taking a photograph of an artwork and converting it in an, into an NFT, to my mind. Uh, mm -hmm. I know people do that, and that's fine. There's no judgment on that. But I, if I'm going to use this new technology, oh, no, no, we like to judge. leverage no, it. Let's go. Let's, let's judge. We like to judge. <laughs> no, we, no, we, no. we like to judge when we see some crap out there that's polluting yeah. all these... Uh, all this uh, NFT space, but no, no yeah. bashing. Uh, you know the rules, Alexis. No we don't bash. We don't bash. We talk about, but we don't bash. So the question okay. is, like, if if we have this, what, why, why use it? What is it that this new technology, this new environment, has to offer, and how can we leverage it? And that's, I, I believe, is really critical and fundamental. Otherwise, we're just replicating what we already have on a new medium. We're, we are copy and pasting, as you said, Alexis. And that's, which is going back to really going right back to the theater work. I didn't see the point of replicating real life on stage. I know you can make an argument for it gives us a way of examining it and exploring ideas, but I wanted to take it further. And we had the opportunity to, so why not do so? So back to your question about the technology, there are two things I found that were actually incredibly simple. Once I started getting, I had the idea of a virtual exhibition, I started Googling, okay, like how do I do 
a virtual exhibition? Like what are what platforms might already exist? And there are several that do that and some that are specifically designed for artists. But I had a very specific set of criteria. I was aware of the metaverse. I've, I've been playing in different metaverses, but most of them require in order for anyone to interact, you needed to have an avatar. You might have to have a wallet. There, was, there were lots of friction points. So I wanted something that allowed people any, uh, the, the litmus test was my dad. Could my dad access this exhibition? So he, and he, there's no way he's going to sit through a Ready Player Me tutorial and try to figure out how to create an avatar. Look, he doesn't care. It's like, that's just, why bother? And, uh, and there's, don't even go there with a wallet and setting up a, a wallet and, you know, all of that stuff. Like, that's just a whole other level of friction. So it couldn't have those features, even though those would be great. Um, and it had to be able to have a way to show my sculptures because I, I work with ceramic as well as paint. So I've got these three dimensional shapes that I needed to somehow show and convert into the virtual spaces. And a lot of them only allow you to do paintings. And I found one platform. It's called Kunstmatrix and they're a German company. And they produce... <laughs> yeah, you, be really, you have to be really that. careful with how you pronounce <laughs> this, Alexis. I would have Alexis. guessed that one. <laughs> really <laughs> careful. <laughs> Push them, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and they've been it, no, no, fantastic. No, 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 please say it yeah. again. Say it again as well for our auditors. Uh, what sure. Is it's, called? it's Kunstmatrix. Uh, Kunstmatrix. Okay. Yeah, we'll, in the edit, Link. I will put it down below. So you will be able to <laughs> yeah, see it on the screen, but it will also in. be yeah. in the show notes just to make that clear for everyone. And I have to say that the team are fantastic there because, like I said, I don't have a technical a coding background or a technical background. Mm -hmm. So I had lots of questions because I, I didn't know how to do everything. But there was two things. So one, I had a platform now that, that was low friction. Anyone could access because literally they have a whole series of three-dimensional galleries with empty walls that you can drag and drop images onto. But they also have podi uh plinths that you could put a three-dimensional object on. So, okay, great. This ticks all the boxes in terms of a space that I can host the work in. The next question is, how do I take these three-dimensional physical objects that I have in my studio and actually put them into that space? And, and again, mm -hmm. it's like, I don't know. So it's back to Google. How do you do it? And I heard about nerfs and photogrammetry. So I knew it was possible. But everything was saying you need an iPhone. And I know, Chris, you're going to say, of course. Uh, I know Who you're doesn't big have an iPhone? I'm confused. Uh, me. me. I don't me. have an iPhone. What do you mean? Me. I don't have an iPhone. Fantastic What's wrong with iPhone? people. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, because the, the iPhone uses a particular, it uses LiDAR, which is a particular way of like, you know, depth perception. And there's amazing apps. And every app I came across, like, oh, here's an app that does it. Only on Apple, another one, only on Apple. But I found a few that worked on Android and they use a slightly different technology. And one of them is called Kiri, Kiri Engine or the Kiri app, K-I-R-I. And, mm -hmm. and with all of these things, I'm always downloading them and having a go. It's like, oh, this is terrible. Or this it doesn't make sense. I don't know how it works. Again, because I'm not super technical. I'm actually more technical than I'm making myself out to sound. But I don't, but I, uh, <laughs> for, for real. I, yeah. But it's like, I need something that, that works because I can't spend three, four hours going through tutorials to learn something because I've got enough other things going on in my life. I need something that just works w really quickly. And I downloaded this app, scanned a T-Bowl that I just happen to have and it, I could not believe it. It was just instantly, just my mind was blown because I, I could spit on my phone. I had a full three-dimensional model replica of this T-Bowl. I could spin it around. I could look upside down. I could look inside nice. it. It was perfect. It, and it was because it's, it's photogrammetry. It's actually taking photographs and stitching them together and using AI to create a seamless shape. But in three dimensions, it, it just... I thought, this is it. This Now I'm ready to go. I have all the pieces I need. I have the artwork. Now I have a tool to translate the three-dimensional pieces into a space, and I have a space to put it into, and that space is accessible. Anyone with a web browser will be able to access this gallery. So I was off to the races. Oh, nice. Not that it's that – not, it, and it makes it sound like, oh, that's it. You just you know scan everything. You know, it's not – it's not immediately, it's like several of the pieces that I was scanning, like I had to do like three or four times. I was totally scared of Blender, which if anyone is an artist and doesn't know Blender, it, it's like the free 3D um, editing program. And if you open mm -hmm. it up and you don't, if you're coming from just like Photoshop as I was, it's completely overwhelming because it can do so much. And, uh, but I ended up had to do a few tutorials on like how to clean up some of the models and do a few bits because the scale was a bit of an issue and then they were too big. But I was also getting a tremendous support from 
the Kunstmatrix platform, their customer support was extraordinary. So it oh, was another so, thing so is, is that, uh, asking questions. Matrix, is, that, is, that, is that a free, is that a free, uh, free platform as well? It, it's, how does free, it work? it's free to uh, create a gallery, but you can't make the gallery publicly accessible until you you um, subscribe. And I think at the moment, the lowest tier, which is what I'm on, is I think $12 a month. So it's very, very affordable for yeah, an cool. exhibition. On their website, so Kunst Matrix provides uh, quality online tools to curate and present mm -hmm. art virtually. Um, yeah. And they do offer this. So obviously, I think we have to probably mention on this show as well, but like something similar to a spatial, for example, where you can yeah. create your own virtual mm -hmm. space. But these yeah. guys have m focused it more, I think, to make it a specifically within the art space uh, and mm -hmm. also specifically actually, within those actually, 3D spaces. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's another one called Vertical, Vertical with a K, vertical.arts mm -hmm. as well. They are a repository of, uh, of uh, basically art and, and, and ancient, um, let's say, uh, I was going to say culture. Yeah. So it's, it's, really, it's really a tower, uh, a virtual tower, of course, like floating on top of Manhattan. And, mm. uh, they want to be the repository of art and culture. Uh, I definitely encourage you guys to uh, visit that place as well. Vertical.art. Again, none of these so, things sorry. are sponsored. I just thought none I mentioned that. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yes, of yeah. course, of course. No, no, but because it, it, it's good that we put forward, right? All these spaces mm. that are yep. available because, uh, again, yep. one of the mission of this row is it's not so much to evangelize people, but as well to show them that, you know, there are things out there that are happening. Right. Yeah. And so it's so great to see those platform allowing, you know, artists, you know, or burgeoning artists coming on board, you know, developing something that they never thought would be art. And then all of a sudden tools are there and they are allowed to do the most magnificent and, you know, mm. emotional things. Because I, I think that's one of the conversations we had, Chris, last time. And, and Jeremiah, tell me if, if you do believe on that. I, I believe one of the things that will bring people to the metaverse is, is when they will have emotions, you know, uh, uh, linked to the experience they're going to have yeah. on the metaverse. If it's boring, there's nothing to do. If this is not a bit, if you have no emotions, why would mm. you go, right? Yeah, I, I agree yeah. 100%. And you mentioned, Alexis, uh, spatial. I love spatial because mm. w w for two things. One, visually, it works. It's beautiful. It's smooth. It, I, I, I'm not a fan of the pixelated sort of crypto voxels type thing or a sandbox. That just doesn't appeal to me. That's probably a generational mm -hmm. thing or exposure. I don't know. But it's like spatial. It's like, wow. And instantly you get a free space. You get to have it. You can decorate it yourself. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. it's just like, so they've reduced a lot of friction, which is fantastic. But the big question is, what do you do there? And, and I think that's, that is an issue with so much of this is is what do we do when we get there? And there might be an activation by a brand that we, we all show up to check it out and then we leave again. There's nothing to retain us. And um, this might be a bit of a hot take, but at the moment, my favorite metaverse is Fortnite because okay. there's always something yeah. to do. There's always yep. something to do. I know what I'm there for, and there's always something happening, and it's always engaging, and it's and, and it's visually beautiful. The other day, I I just logged in and I I found a way to turn all the sounds down, and I could stream uh, Spotify at the same time, and I just yes. ran through the landscape. Nice. I just mm. went through the landscape, and it wow. was beautiful. I was I'm, in this. I'm going to jump in on this point, and the only reason yep. I'm going to jump in is so in last week's episode, we were talking massively about the insider article uh, by the PR mm. guy, Ed Zitron, and I was really hating on that article all week. I've been posting stuff about it. It really pissed me off, but he yep. posted the article <laughs> that said basically RIP Metaverse, mm -hmm. um, and he basically, although it was an opinion piece, it was very much pushed by Business Insider as a piece of news, and I think that was right. the piece that really yeah. pissed mm. me off about it, but Interestingly enough, it was uh, Tim Sweeney, the CEO of um, Epic, who basically was like that, like taking the absolute piss out of this article. But he was like that. Yep, completely. Uh, the metaverse is dead. We should just invite all 600 million VR and gamers that are using these platforms like Minecraft, like Fortnite, uh, like Roblox. And all 600 million of these people should come to the vigil. And I think it was a really interesting point of just reminding everyone, like we do, we try and do every week on this show, mm -hmm. the numbers of people when you start adding things like Fortnite or like Roblox, mm -hmm. the number of people that we're now talking about is exponentially huge, right? There's 600 million gamers using these platforms. <clears throat> these platforms are more than just um games and this is the key thing right yeah, it's not right. like well, the now, olden now, days now with Jeremiah, we see it's a platform it's a platform to go and discover some uh, some art and you know like uh, for, for, for people that don't have 
you know, the, the, the opportunity of maybe going to a museum or not maybe because they don't have the time or because it's so mm. far away. Uh, also, maybe because, you know, maybe the, that particular museum is not the type of art they're interested in. Now we have, you know, another gateway to something that is very emotionally connecting. It's mm. art. And I think art is, again, uh, we, we keep mentioning, we, we, we say that education will be uh, very important for the metaverse. But, uh, you know, I'm delighted to have you on the show so we can really speak about how much art will be, you know, important for, for the metaverse in, in general, as well as, you know, we, we see other type of industry, like notably, uh, we see travel industry as well, you know, uh, taking an advantage of what the metaverse uh, has to offer. But, um, yes, um, uh, having artists and, and creativity and, you know, having so many tools that can decouple creativity and imagination. And again, I'm not saying about like doing some uh, doodle NFTs, even though that might be considered as art, you know, uh, having, having this, this tool in this environment, it's, it's, it's fascinating, mm. really. So, Jemai, yeah. I want to ask you, so, um, so you're doing that, obviously, uh, I understand as an artist, you're doing that because that's your, your passion. But at some point, you'd like to monetize uh, all these efforts mm. as well. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you go about that? Well, okay, there, there, there's several factors. And actually, I just want to just, just go back really quickly on, on what uh, Tim Sweeney was saying. Is, mm. It's like, what, what metaverse are we talking about? That the, I view my virtual gallery that I've now created as a pocket metaverse. Like it's a self-contained own metaverse, but it's still a metaverse. It's a virtual interactive world that anyone can go into and, and walk around and, and interact with. And so if, if we expand the idea of what the metaverse is, it's not just these these, plat the, these sort of headline platforms like Roblox and Fortnite and so on, mm. that, um, that, that there are many other forms of the metaverse. And I, I do think they are going to slowly converge. And there will be, like, like I know you had Guarang on uh, a few episodes back with the, um, the EIP 5606, I think it is. The um, multiverse so NFTs. We're That's looking right. for, a, we're, we're moving towards greater interoperabilities. And when that occurs, and as that becomes easier, then all of these smaller versions of the metaverse will start to converge. And that means there will be just less friction and more opportunity for everyone to engage with it because they're different, they're multiple entry points. Not everyone's a gamer. So like for me, I'm, I'm, I, I do a tiny bit of gaming, but I'm an artist. So I'm coming at it from a completely different angle. And once though my method of, of onboarding is more seamlessly integrated with all the other forms that other people are coming in through, then we start to create literally an entire another world where that has all the nuance and layers of, of these other worlds. Um, so to your, your question, I think Alexis was um, of monetization of art. So through okay. the platform, you can, you can it's, it's very easy for if someone likes a piece of work, they can click on it, they can find out more, and then they can get directly in touch with me or any other artist who uses the platform to, mm -hmm. to request the work. There, um, there's still a lot of friction around uh, payment rails, I mean, even which is really interesting. I think that's going to be an interesting question to resolve as we move forward is what is a sort of universal payment rail that anyone can use. But, uh, and <laughs> don't get me started on shipping and international shipping. Pepe, Pepe token is usually the uh, the standardized payment <laughs> method, right? Oh, it will be. <laughs> it will be. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if you guys saw, but uh, actually, in the, talking about shit coins again, we're not demonizing anybody. Yeah. But uh, people that <laughs> did that gigantic penis, like spewing cash out of the out of the head, and that was like a turbo turbo coin. And I bought some of that turbo coin, and I can tell you, it did not do what people was promising me. It did not crazy. cash out of the head. Sorry, wait, wait. You're telling me that you bought a coin called Turbo yes, Coin that had no <laughs> backstory, nothing about it that has any kind of basis in other, reality, other than and it didn't make you money? <laughs> what? That's not how Web3 is supposed to work. Well, but that's how we try to make it work. I mean, come on, Pepe and Turbo. Yeah. Now, the reason why I bought that Pepe thing is because, mm. uh, sorry, that, that Turbo thing is because, again, people did, you know, like a little something about that, which I thought it was funny, but also because, you know, it's like, like a fully AI constructed sort of a token. I, I don't buy, I don't buy token and I don't, this is not financial advice. Don't buy any token that is promoted by an artist that turns it in a shape of a dick and spews yeah. out money like that, okay? Now... <laughs> Also, don't buy show. anything that we talk about on this show. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not financial advice. Sorry, Jeremiah, I derailed that. Definitely, but no, 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 not no. being the monetary side of it. But you are right no. that there is a real problem in terms of how do you buy stuff and how do you in interconnect these things to make it simple. So, mm. what can you buy? How does it get delivered? Where does it get delivered? If it's a digital product, yeah. 
we're talking about things like wallets and things like that as well. We had a really yeah. interesting conversation with a massive big brand in the real world, like Web2 world. Uh, they've done a huge collection. They've got tons of people claiming these free NFTs, for example. Uh, they end up using an email address to create a wallet using one of the third-party platforms that are available. So on ETH, there's things like Web3 Auth. And then literally once they've got that, they have a wallet, but they don't have any interest in a wallet. What they were mm. interested in was claiming whatever it was that was free or getting access to whatever it was that was theirs. Once they've got that, it's the wallet side, like you said, right? If the litmus test of your dad, if your dad can't get yep. into this, it's never going to happen. And I had another mm. conversation literally this morning. We were recording something else. And the, the guy said it really, really well. It's the complexity of onboarding, which is limiting Web3. And it's so mm -hmm. true. As soon as you say to someone, right, you're going to set up a wallet, but make sure you don't lose these 12 key magic words. And if you don't have those mm -hmm. magic words, yeah. it's not yours. But actually, all of these things, right, it just makes for a level of complexity where if you went to sign up for a bank account and somebody told you, you've got to keep these 12 words. And if you'd ever lose you these would. 12 words, you lose action to all your money. You wouldn't do it. Yeah, you, ah, you just wouldn't record. do it. No, I think I think I think if if that was the rule, that was the rule, and 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 that's that. No, but there's okay, right? So, but there's an element. I mean, of, give it, I want, no, 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 I no, want it to be no, my face that has those twelve. No, like, it, things, no, no, right? no, it, it, no. It gives the same. No, see, because uh, it's the same as for driving a car. You need to have that piece of paper, which you need to, you know, do that much, you know, learning work mm. before going on the road and kill everybody. And if you don't have that piece of paper, then you will don't have, you don't have access yeah. to. But your but your driver's license but your driver's license anyway your driver's license identifies who you are with a photo your name your address and your like it's the most and KYC my ability, document and my, in the and world. my ability to 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 have a little weapon that's right right <laughs> which is the car anyway yeah, yeah okay. it is a lethal weapon anyway sorry <laughs> Jeremiah. <laughs> No, no, but but I think to your point, I think that's where some of these other brands, um, like we've seen with Starbucks or uh, Mastercard, I think, doing sort of uh, self-host now the warm wallets. I think they're calling them. They're, they're they're hosting it on behalf of the user, and they're kind of mm. just stripping that away, so it's, it's not even mentioned really. It's in the same way that you have a, um, I, I don't know, like on, on your Amazon account, and they have all. They're just hold. They have essentially almost a wallet on your behalf, or your credit mm -hmm. card is, and so it's just there to function in the background. And I think once we get to the point where things are functioning in the background, because at the moment the infrastructure is in our face, and we all are engaging with the infrastructure. And once that infrastructure actually sinks down to the level where it's supposed to be, which is underneath and supporting the activities, then we can just carry on with the activities that we want to do. The question is are there activities that we want to do in this space? Like, what's the utility of this space? And um, I think that's that's a, a yet another question. However, I do think, and just to tie this back to, like, because someone might be listening, go, why is this artist who's making real-world artworks, like, I'm not even working with digital artworks, yeah. I'm um, working in this space, and it's because I believe this space has tremendous potential for evolving humanity. I think it's the next step in human evolution, culturally as well as as a species. Agreed. Because yeah. once we really embrace what's possible here, then we'll really be able to push culture well, it transcends, exponentially it transcends further. People, right? It transcends people, it transcends culture, it transcends the race, it transcends a lot of things. Exactly. I, yes. I agree. I was thinking about this just the other night. Once we get familiar and comfortable with interacting with other people who have virtual avatars that don't look like them, we start yeah. to create the very first gap that's ever happened in human culture where we're no longer judging people by what they look like, which is such an ingrained fundamental even, subconscious even, even, even action. Even during the reptilians? Even during the reptilian times? Really? I'm sure because I'm sure you know, if just if you think about it, you know, like even on that very primitive level, the bigger, more muscular is probably going to be the more attractive for mating with. You know, if you want to increase your bloodline, uh, continue your bloodline. So the evolutionary level, it's programmed into the human brain to make judgments about external appearances of other people. And, and what would happen to culture if we could actually create a bit of space between that that really primitive programming and how we show up and interact with people culturally in, in, on a one-to-one -one level. And if we actually, in two or three generations in the future, where everyone is so familiar and used to meeting with people and not knowing what they physically look like, but only react, interacting with an avatar, 
that might actually start to trickle back into our interhuman relations mm -hmm. when we actually meet people in person and go, actually, you know what? You, you, that person may not actually be what they look like. And, and so it's we okay. Have to and that's okay. And it's okay. Well, no, because yeah. then we, we're judging them on the interaction we have. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It's that's like, because when you meet an avatar, you have no idea who that person is. You can't look at their trainers and go, oh, those are fake mm -hmm. uh, uh, Air Force Ones or whatever, or that's a fake um, Balmain handbag. It's like, we, we can't judge them for that. Or it looks like they haven't washed their hair in three days and make judgments about it. We see the avatar and we don't know who's behind it. So then the only thing we have to judge is how they interact with us. And then we're getting into some really interesting new dynamics. And where does that take us in the future? Well, Listen, I mean, Jeremiah, I think we could probably talk about this, especially with Alexis here, um, and he's going to end That's up right. bringing up the adult entertainment industry as being the future <laughs> of how this all ends up interacting together. But before we wrap up, I'm going to ask you one last question from my point of view, and I'd love to know what your point of uh, what your thoughts are on this. But mm. what do you think the future of art looks like then in the metaverse? That's a great question. Uh, and I think it, the, mm, the reason I'm hesitating is because art is so dynamic and so diverse and it has such a there, there's such a wide spectrum because there's art that responds to the now and there's there, there's reactive art and then there's art that's projecting into the future and then there's art that doesn't fit within either of those categories um, plus the legacy of art that we have behind us so i i don't think we can even imagine or conceive what art will look like but I do think that the media that we use to create the art is going to expand. And I think there's a great, there's, there's so much potential in working that with these virtual worlds as a, as a multidimensional canvas that we've only just barely started to scratch the surface of. And once we, and, and okay, let me, let me reframe this. I don't know what the art's going to look like, but I think that this new canvas that we have, which is virtual worlds, is going to allow us to expand the human imagination far beyond anything we've ever done in the past. And that's the exciting thing, is that we are going to be working and thinking in completely new ways that we, because we've been so constrained, just unconsciously constrained by the physical world around us and how we interact with it. And once those constraints, are, once we realize those constraints are no longer uh, necessary, that we don't have to worry about the weight of a material. We don't have to worry about the cost of a material. We don't have to worry about the size. I can build anything at any scale and I can create work that will persist over maybe eons into the future using blockchain. We know that blockchain can persist forever provided the infrastructure is there to support it. Once we start thinking on these scales, that scale now is no longer a limitation, then where do we go imaginatively? And when we really, truly embrace the, the scope and potential of this, then we're going to see an explosion of, of, of human um, consciousness and imagination, and it's going to be extraordinary. But we have to start being bolder. We have to start taking advantage of this new space. And, and so just for anyone who's listening, who's an artist, to think like, I, I'm not technical, keep checking out what's available. Because three months ago, the apps and the programs I was using probably didn't exist, and they do now. And in three months from now, there'll be new ones that we're going to make it even easier. We will be someone. here. We'll be here, Jeremiah, to remember, so, remind everybody. I'm ready for we'll season two. Remind everybody. Yeah. And well, I think really, I, I thank just... you so much for... <laughs> For, just really, for putting all this information out really quickly though what i will say you said something there jeremiah and i think it's huge and allowing us to expand human imagination more than ever before and to yeah. me this is still this is why alexis and i turn up every week to do a podcast about mm. the metaverse the potential we talk about this a lot it's not about what's happening right now it's about yeah. where we end up and where we are in 10 20 30 50 years and again remember 100%. if we had you know, if you had asked people back in the days of Henry Ford just getting started, whether they wanted a mm. faster horse or whether they wanted a Model T, they would have taken the faster horse. Like, this is where we're at, right? And I think that's yeah. just a really, really important piece. So I love that quote from you. Um, Jeremiah, where can people find you, connect with you so that they can come and ask you directly what you did, what tools mm. or anything else that they might want to uh, to ask? Yep. So you can find me anywhere at Jeremiah Craigie. Uh, so Craigie is K-R-A-G-E, all one word. And that's on Twitter, Instagram, my website, jeremiahcraigie.com. So pretty much LinkedIn, Jeremiah Craigie. So, yep, uh, feel free to get in touch. Uh, I, I love talking about, thinking about this. I love having my own 
uh, perceptions and limitations being challenged. So the, this is the future and we all need to be pushing each other to, to think bigger and broader and wider and longer term uh, because it's exciting. So yeah. Wonderful. Get, if you're not Love here, it. get Wonderful. here now. Really appreciate that, Jeremiah. Thank you so much. Lovely to meet you guys. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>